Hours of Beach. Our ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Professor Eric Vanlitz from Emory University. He judges, in my opinion, most of the sort of high-end critical debates in college that exist between policy teams and non-traditional teams. And so you're dealing with someone that has uh, a pretty serious familiarity with not just where these arguments are at, but where they might be going. So let's give a round of applause. All right. So I want to start with a bit of a story. Uh, I'm probably am not going to be walking around as much as you can see. Got a bit of a bum right uh, left knee. What happened? Uh, yeah, I was running and my knee said no. <laughs> sure. So, uh, but I want to start with a bit of a story. Um, I had a I had a different lecture, sort of set up about three week or three days ago, and I was very excited about this lecture, and I was ready to give it. And then, uh, does anybody here know who Tom York is? Radiohead. Anybody heard of them? Am I the only one? Thank you, sir. Right? I started listening to some music, and I, I, I was listening to his new album, which is phenomenal, and they've got this song that is called uh, Jigsaw Falling Into Place. And when I thought about that, I looked at my lecture, and I was like, I didn't like it. And the reason I didn't like uh, the lecture was I wanted to have a more robust conversation about how to debate the critique, as opposed to here are a litany of critique things that exist that you all may be interested in, but it will be extraordinarily shallow and maybe not nearly as useful. So I wanted to teach more of a framework on how to debate critiques, go over them, because we have a very broad audience in this room. We have a lot of young people who have very little experience debating the critique. We may have a few people that go for the game, they think uh, quite often. And so I wanted to sort of summarize what I think the critique, uh, how it needs to be debated, where it's sort of going, and then hopefully at the end, uh, we all will learn something pretty, pretty valuable. There will be a, a Q&A section for you all to ask all of your, Eric, can you tell us what black gold yard is? And I will look at you with a blank stare and go, ask your lab leader. But we will definitively talk about um, some uh, versions of critiques towards the end. So let's start off with the basics. Uh, a critique is a off-case position. The shell is likely to have the following components, a link argument, a impact argument, and sometimes it is there, but not always. Uh, it has a, a reason to prioritize or evaluate the debate differently, sometimes called a role of the ballot or a framework argument. Now, the framework argument is not the same as when you're going for framework, say, against a planless F, uh, but it is called framework. And generally, an alternative, uh, which I would find as something that we can do differently or a different way to think about the world. I'm going to go into uh, depth on each one of these parts of the critique and how they work in debate. But first, uh, someone who, who's willing to admit that they are not as experienced as going for the critique, what is missing from the critique that normally shows up in a disag? Yes, sir? Uniqueness. Right? Critiques are different than disads. Critiques do not have uniqueness. The reason for this, does anybody know what the reason for why critiques don't have uniqueness? Uh, I saw a hand in the back. Yes? The alt generates uniqueness for the K? Well, that's sort of how like a counterplan works in some way. That may be true, but I'm looking for something different. Uh, yes, in the back. Because they're not unique. Well, obviously. Uh, but why is there no uniqueness? Can they criticize Mm, nah. I think yeah. they're justified for me why a plan doesn't have to be like a bad idea in the status quo, but that it can be like complicit in or like defending better structures that are harmful. You, you've described, I think, a component of the link that I will talk about, but I don't think it sort of gets at the uniqueness question. So we'll, we'll sort of talk about that because I want to sort of demystify some of the things for why we need this is not a critique. Uh, uniqueness does not uh, exist in a critique because a disad is a plan-focused argument. A disad is about the consequences of implementing the plan, and a critique tends to be focused on the entirety of the 1AC. What are the choices that go into writing the entirety of the 1AC? What is the story, 
the one AC is telling. It is a critique of the worldview presented by the affirmative. And notice I didn't just say the plan, but the entirety of the 1AC. Now this doesn't mean that we won't argue about the plan, but there are a broader set of things that go into building the plan that the critique generally wants to criticize. Someone tell me what they think the definition of a critique is. Who thinks they know what the definition of a critique is? Yes, and if you don't know the definition of a critique, how can we talk about Bolger? Griffith? Uh, it's a critique of the like, assumptions and knowledge creation behind the app, and it has an alternative way to create those. It's close to what I have. Who wants to take a double shot? Yes, sir. What's your name? Daniel. Daniel. It's what do you say? You have to be weird. It's about a clash of different worldviews. Clash of different worldviews. I like that. Four week. Four week. Come on in. All right. For those of you all who did not have uh, a definition, this is what my definition is. Um, it is certainly up for debate, as all things are. A critique is an argument that criticizes the assumptions and methods and or values that make the app appear desirable. Do I need to repeat that? Yes, sure. A critique is an argument that criticizes the assumptions, methods, and or values that make the app desirable. When I say desirable, right, when an app is read, Generally, the reason that it is desirable is because of the advantages or the problems that it solves. When I say up here, that's connecting uh, to the critique argument or the definition I said earlier, which just sort of changes the way the judge evaluates the debate. If I need to repeat anything, or if you say, just say repeat, and I will definitively repeat it for you, okay? <coughs> Affirmatives and DA debates rarely do the two sides disagree on how the impact is to be evaluated. Yes, there are times when there are things like a plan was said that is a separate conversation than what I'm speaking of. And you may also say, hey, Eric, what about when there's a path that someone has like a soft left advantage or a sort of seemingly particular advantage? Those things are possible, but those two things, they do not disagree on how the common impact is to be evaluated. They have common value structures. Counterplan and DA uh, debates are plan focused, which means it is about a unique outcome or an opportunity cost created by the plan. <coughs> sure. In counterplan and DA debates, the plan, they, I'm sorry, counterplan and DA debates, they are plan focused which means they are about a unique outcome or an opportunity cost by the plan. That the plan and the plan alone causes a certain set of consequences. That is what it means by uniqueness, right? We talked earlier, I was like, why is the uniqueness there, right? Uniqueness is about the plan and the plan only. When we are talking about DA counter plan debates, Right? It is what the plan and the plan only uniquely trigger. <coughs> if the 1AC is the focus of the debate, it is a way to remind us that uniqueness is a tool in debate, but it is only a tool to evaluate those consequences, and critiques offer a different set of ways to evaluate those consequences. Now, why do we have critiques in debate? Yes. Are you basically asking? Sure. Uh, I'll, 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 take a, I'll take a listen. Uh, I was just going to say to critically analyze the affirmative. Yeah, I agree. It is to critically analyze the affirmative. The critique came into existence <coughs> back in the early 90s uh, from a team from Texas that is far before my time or any one time, I think, maybe in this room. So I don't know why that is the case. But I would say the critique allows us to bring structural or historical concerns into debate. Those things that aren't just outcomes of the plan, but those things that might shape a larger construction of the 1AC. And I'll repeat that if you all need. All right? Ready? All right. 
critiques allow us to bring structural or historical concerns into debate. Those things that aren't just outcomes of the plan, but those things that might shape the larger sense, uh, the larger construction of the 1AC, the larger story that the 1AC is telling. So that does go back to what the young lady said in regards to why the critique is sort of being debated. Uh, this creates a major difference between other arguments that we would normally see in debate uh, because we aren't comparing the plan to a stable status quo or an alternative policy action, but instead we are going to treat the 1AC as a construct, as a choice, right? What do you think I mean by the 1AC as a choice? <coughs> Who wants to take a stab at that? Yes, in the back. Um, but it's not the way the world is now, right? You're not taking uh, the, what the 1A, or 1AC says as, yes, that's what the world is, and we're going to debate it like that. You're taking it as, um, that's their point of view, and here's what we have to say about it. Okay. In the back. Um, the affirmative has infinite amount of prep time to pick any affirmative that they want and any plan that they want to represent, and so the uh, negative can construct or critique the way that that was constructed, the way they chose to construct that. I like the way that was starting, right? I think that the thought that I have is that 1AC has chosen <coughs> this as the starting point for the debate. So criticism is a critique of the, that assumption. Why did you choose this starting point? Why did you choose these set of arguments, this set of story to tell about the world? For those of you all who have sort of read over the security critique, the security K is at criticizing the structure of the Taiwan AF and potentially the Saudi, Saudi AF as the construction of China as a threat. Why did you choose that story, right? And we'll sort of talk about that a little bit later. The 1AC is about a unique, uh, why did I write that? The 1AC is about uh, a unique, uh, in that, sorry, the 1AC is about uniqueness, right? So when, normally when the 1AC is written in terms of policy analysis, it is about the uh, unique outcome of the plan. Critiques will generally dispute the entirety of this process. Uh, I sort of want to show a piece of evidence uh, that I think sort of describes the process of criticism, and we will sort of read it together, okay? Um, who wants to read the first uh, line that we have here for me? Who wants to read that for me? Then ready. Like the, Yeah, the first, the, the part that's highlighted. Can you zoom? Yeah, give me a second. How's that? Yeah. Problem, sorry. Problem solving theory takes the world as it finds it with the prevailing social and power relationships and the institutions as the given framework for action. Okay. I want to suggest that the affirmative is an example of problem solving approaches. This is critical to sort of understanding critique debating at its uh, basic. We identify a problem, the advantage, and the solution, which generally is the plan. Affirmers are not usually about changing the social order or institutions they take them as granted, right? This part says, as a given framework for action. Given that the United States federal government wants to pursue a foreign policy, it has a certain number of objectives it wants to achieve. What are those objectives and how can they achieve them? That's basically the affirmer. It is an instrument in its goal in, of improving the workings of those institutions, but does not call into question the patterns or purposes of those institutions, okay? Now, what do I mean by an instrument? When I say it is an instrument in its goal of improving the workings of those institutions, what do I mean by instrument? Yes? Do you utilize, like, the problem-solving theory where to fix the problems of the world? Yeah, like, you know, it's a tool, right? It's a tool on how we can get from point A to point B. Affirmatives and plans are things that help us to get from point A to point B. The status quo, there is a problem. The plan is a solution, post-plan. That's it. Now, who uh, would like to read the second part for me? Go ahead. Critical theory stands apart from the prevailing order and asks how that order came about. Critical theory does not make institutions and social 
granted, but calls them into question. It is an appraisal of the very framework of action, which calls itself a theory, except as it's a parameter. Right. The winning seat takes uh, place within the parameters of the resolution. Reduction of arm sales, obviously, that is the parameters that are set by the resolution. Critical theory or critiques challenges those parameters. It does not take the world as given. Okay? And so, the reason I like this sort of card is because it sort of sets up sort of a contrast between the policymaking world and the world of the criticism. And it asks how that world needs to be a challenge and why we should take the world as a given. Okay? All right. We have one more. Who wants to read the last one for me? Faith. Um, I don't see it. Huh? Oh, I'm saying I would say it. Sorry, start at uh, critical theory, the highlight part. Uh, Can you see it? Or do I need to make it bigger? I thought it was just one of those. Oh, we didn't? Oh, wait, no, that's not the one anymore. Yeah, it's Thank you. Yeah, it's critical theory, the highlight part. Yeah, I thought it was just one of those. Okay. There we go, that part. Critical theory is concerned with the problems of the real world. It aims to, um, are just as, pra as practical, but its approaches form a perspective that transcends the existing order. Critical theory limits the range of choice to alternative orders, which are feasible transformations of the existing world. Critical theory can be a guide to strategic action for bringing about um, an alternative order, whereas problem-solving theory is a guide to tactical actions which sustain an existing order. What does this sound like? What does this sound like for those of you all who have debated or critique or a critique? What does this sound like? Yes, David. Framework. Framework. To Griffin. Response to see political. Mm -hmm. It's the alternative versus the plan. It's the alternative versus the one AC. It says critical theory can be a guide for strategic action, actions to bring about an alternative order, whereas problem solving theory, i.e., the affirmative, is a technical action which sustain the existing order. Does that make sense? Okay. If at any point in time you're like, Eric, what? <coughs> if you need me to explain, please act here to do so. This is sort of dense stuff. I know it can get a little confusing, but I think this is necessary uh, for us to engage in critical debate. All right. Yes. I think that's a generic explanation of what an alternative is compared to what a normal 1AC is, right? The goal of an alternative, we'll talk about this a little bit later, the goal of the alternative is to present a different way of thinking about the world, a different way to sort of transform that world. Insert any critique you've ever run, and generally that is the point of the alternative. Rarely will you see an alternative that says, we should have the United States federal government embrace Afro-pessimism. Sure. Perm. Have fun. Right? So it is about a thinking differently about the world to bring about a different world. Does that make sense? We'll go into depth about that a little bit later. That's a great question. All right. Any other questions? Any questions about what I've said so far? Anything that you were confused about? I'm good? All right. Let's talk about link debating. Now, when thinking about link arguments, right, there's also a link to a disad. But the link to a disad and the link to a critique are two different things. Thank you. Links and critique change the way in which critique link change the way in which we debate the link arguments. The link arguments as a for a critique, in my opinion, and this is my definition of uh, links for critiques, work as an example of the choices and assumptions that the affirmative makes. Yep, gotcha. Critique links are examples of the choices or assumptions that the affirmative makes. According to my definition, critiques critique the desirability of the affirmative. The link arguments need to explain how and where those assumptions show up. So in a disag, right, the plan and only the plan triggers a set number of events. 
for the criticism, the critique is saying that there is a bunch of flawed assumptions that exist. And here are where those flawed assumptions exist in the affirmative. There's a difference. Instead of saying I need to read a bunch of link cards that say political capital, uh, the plan drains political capital, I may need to instead find where in the 1AC those assumptions show up. We'll talk about how to do so. But when we use the link as an example, uh, it says that an assumption that we have made about the world exists in the 1AC. That also means that linked arguments help us in deciding about the importance of those assumptions in the affirmative or advocacy of the 1AC, the sort of strength of those assumptions. It asks the question, do we have to make that assumption for the 1AC to be desirable? Do I need to construct China as a threat in order for us to say we should reduce arms sales. See how that makes sense? Anybody need me to repeat that? Yes, yes. Gotcha. The link arguments help us decide the importance <coughs> of the assumptions made in the affirmative or advocacy of the 1AC. The strength of those assumptions. I can't believe I'm also standing, and I am wobbly because my knee is like, why are you doing this? It says, do we have to make those assumptions in order for the 1AC to be desirable? So, to use the example that we have for uh, security and the Taiwan Act, do we have to construct China as a threat in order to say that arms sales to Taiwan are bad? That is the question being posed. Does that make sense? Make sense? All right. This also means, and this is something that goes into how do we debate the critique that I rarely see. Uh, Professor Repco explained that I judge a lot of clash debates in college. Sometimes those are fun. Sometimes maybe not. But the one thing that I like to see when I am watching critique debates, and this is what I'm going to talk about now, is that critique arguments are your ability to debate the case. You might be making link arguments in the 2AC that say the following. Okay? Link arguments are your way to debate the case. Earlier I said, a value or an assumption is dangerous or flawed. I have also said that the value exists in the 1AC. If you combine those to make a strong link argument, you will be debating the case argument by saying, in this situation, we should not be making those assumptions because... Dot, 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 dot. You see how we're debating the case? by showing the flawed assumptions, how they can manifest themselves in the 1AC. If you win that the AV leads to a dangerous set of assumptions that have a dangerous set of outcomes, this is how we debate the case. Because if those assumptions trigger dangerous outcomes, those outcomes probably mean we shouldn't do the claim or do the act. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to everybody? Sure. If we win the link argument, much like you've probably heard in the disadvantage, that if we win the link, it turns the ad. If we win that the 1AC has a set number of dangerous assumptions, and those dangerous assumptions have dangerous outcomes, then that means those dangerous outcomes are reasons for why the app is bad. In debate 101, if you win that the app is bad, you'll win that we should not do the app. This is something that doesn't happen a lot and critique debating, which is why I decided to sort of do this lecture. It may not be the fun lecture where we're going to talk about all these different authors, but it is about making you better at debating the critique. For example, in the security critique, it basically says naming China as a potential threat to American-led global order, i.e. the things American institutions value, things like democracy, uh, or maintain, uh, are maintaining American exceptionalism. 
These types of politics, and by politics I mean what the critique is referring to as assumptions, uh, by those policies are dangerous, and in doing so, formulates and creates the conditions for all types of imperial domination. Someone give me an example quickly of imperial domination. Colonization. Nicholas. Banana republics. What? When the U.S. like intervened. Oh, I thought you were talking about like the store. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? I mean, sure, banana republic could be a form of imperialism. I am not here to say yeah or nay. Uh, yes. Uh, Japan in the 1800s. What was the outcome of that imperialism? A lot of death. Okay. So if I win that the Av leads to a lot of death, if I lead, win that the Av leads to a lot of wars, a lot of conflicts, should we do the plan? No. Okay? Debating the link requires that you debate the case in this way. All the great debaters you've probably seen on video or watched the various other places, I guess you want to say, right? All do this. It's the ones that aren't very good that you know act like they're good at debating the critique. Griffin. If you are, you need to prove that like because you think there's an impact that that causes a lot of death. Don't you then have to prove uniqueness and that like that imperialism and death isn't going to happen without the plan? Or? Maybe right. I think one of the things in saying that is we said earlier that in this situation, their maintaining of American imperialism triggers these set of effects. We also have an alternative, which we'll talk about later, that says we need to change the existing order, right? So all of a sudden, while we do not have uniqueness, we are now talking about potential unique outcomes of a plan, and we have a way of resolving those things. We'll talk about that a little bit later. That's a good question. All right. Way to make link arguments good. Everybody okay? Get to link. Good link arguments, especially in the 2NC. Uh, let me stop, time out for a second. Eric Rant 101. I am not a fan of the critique being in the one and all. So I will always say the 2NC. Right? Why do you think I don't like the critique in the one and all? This is real, real easy. Niggas. No, not, not you. you. You know why. Someone that has not uh, seen me a bunch of times. Yes, in the back. Uh, there's just not enough time to pull it. It's five it. minutes. It is five minutes. Normally when people, I, how many people in high school, you all are in high school, I assume. How many people have seen someone make like 15 plus answers on a critique? Because they are paranoid about the critique. How many of you have made a bunch of answers on a critique? Because you are paranoid about the critique. All right. If someone is making 15 to 20 answers on the critique, why are you two ends making your one end do all this heavy lifting? Probably because you don't want to be AK, probably because you want to talk about a counter plan, probably because you want to go for the impact terms. I really like d -Dale. I really like d -Dale. Okay? Right? I get it. But don't do that. Right? There's too much heavy lifting. All right. Back to the lecture. Good link arguments, especially in the two and sheets, two and C, should explain a combination of evidence from the one and C. And point out where those assumptions exist in the one AC and potentially the two AC. I'll repeat that. Let me know where y'all are. Alright. Good link arguments in the 2NC should explain a combination of evidence from the 1NC and point out where those assumptions exist in the 1AC and potentially the 2AC. This should be the beginning of your link wall of the critique for whatever critique you want to go for. Notice, I did not say read more cards, right? What did I say? I say find the assumptions in the 1AC. <coughs> huh? And potentially the 2AC. Why? Because the 2AC, they may read more cards that prove the assumptions. They may read an add-on. Right? They may read, they may say something on another piece of paper that sort of helps establish what you're trying to go for in the critique. Now, some of you all may go and say the following. Eric, how do I do this and have enough prep time to sort of like answer all the arguments. I only got eight to 10 minutes, roughly a prep time. How do I do this? 
a lot of this work for the 1A seat is going to start prior to the debate. How many people know what, a, what the wiki is? Okay. The wiki, for those of you who don't know, excuse me, is a place where uh, you can find out what your opponents are saying prior to the debate. How many times when you all are negative have you seen someone have the entirety of their app on the wiki? If you are someone who likes to go for the critique and you want to set up critique links better, you need to go through the 1AC and highlight places where those assumptions of the critique you are talking about appear in the 1AC. Don't wait for the prep time of the 2NC. This should be done prior to. It should also probably be done prior to like going to the debate tournament because you're probably doing a lot of work to research what apps people are going to read. So therefore, you should go ahead and start preparing those link arguments then. Don't wait till the debate. Obviously, if it's a new app, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, I've got two hands up. I'm going to start. I, I, keep, I know your name, but I forgot. Yes. Uh, Sachi. Sachi, thanks. Uh, so I guess in the two there's probably several links. Do you think that the are should sort of consolidate to just one? That's a good question. Uh, one of the things that become problematic about uh, K-debating, and I'm sort of like situated here, is when a 2N goes for way too many links, you should probably go for a combination of one to three and develop them strongly as opposed to going for, say, seven and having them be extraordinarily shallow. Because, let's go back to something I said earlier. What makes a good critique argument? You are debating the what? No. Well, yes, as you're debating the case. The 1AC, right? The link argument must debate the case, but also helps turn the case. So if you have seven shallow link arguments in a five-minute speech, chances are you are not properly developing the link arguments in the way that they should be. Sasha, does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, should we read the highlights in the 1NC or in the 2NC? In the 2NC. Okay. Um, you want to wait for the 2NC because why would you give the 2A a chance to respond? Make sense? Right? You want to save it for the block or by block the 2NC. Why? Because it shouldn't be anyone know. We have link evidence. Oh, sorry. Any other questions before I go forward? We good? All right. We have link evidence that says maintaining, Amer uh, maintaining a politics of American exceptionalism by constructing China as a threat cements China as an uncivilized other and creates the possibilities for all forms of imperial domination, aka banana republic. We need to start setting up in the 2NC where the affirmative makes these assumptions, highlight where they show up. We might look for a piece of evidence that says the prospects of war between us and China can only come about from the continuation of arms sales to Taiwan, that that continued arms sales will cause China to freak out or lash out. Notice how I'm saying words that indicate that China is irrational. China is the uncivilized other that we need to control. Okay? <coughs> Something along those lines. Or maybe for like the CCP advantage, the distinction between Chinese New World Order and democratic world order. In our lab, we sort of talked about the liberal world order a little bit. If you don't quite know what that is, talk to your lab leaders about it. They'll love to chat about it. Here, the link argument is about creating a dichotomy between us and them. We're good. Our world order is great. We're the good guys. We're good people. China the civilized. China the other. China bank. Does that make sense? You see how we're like pointing out places in the 1AC. Now, how do you do that in the 2NC? When you write your 2NC block, I would just do the following. The 1NC, the 1NC link assumptions show up in the following places. Author, assumption. Author, assumption. So the judge can highlight where in the 1NC they should look at the end of the debate to know that those assumptions have shown up. Nicholas. Do you have to highlight the following? Because I have questions to ask after the mm. round. I would, right? Like I've highlighted cards in yellow. If you're going to point out where those cards are, you should copy and paste those assumptions on a different dot and maybe put them in like green or something. Something that sort of like makes it stick out in the judge's mind. The things that I just described above helps us establish that you're actually debating the case 
you're doing the heavy lifting. You're demonstrating all the places those assumptions show up. Your 2NC should include the phrases that are in the 1NC and potentially in the 2AC to highlight those assumptions. Okay? That's lunch today. Generally, what comes next is the impact. Um, this is like a this had impact. I don't really need to waste a lot of time here. The assumptions lead to bad outcomes. Those bad outcomes lead to a lot of bad things. We'll sort of re come back to the impact a little bit later, but nothing really special about this at this time. All right. Prioritization or the framework argument. This is the most part, this is the part that's most different than a disa. This is a place where the judge should evaluate the debate differently or a different set of concerns decide the outcome of the debate. Another way to think about this is if our link arguments are just examples, why do they matter? This goes to Griffin's point about uniqueness, right? Why do they matter? Because in the world of uniqueness, these are just like interesting facts. They're glorified FYI. The world is racist. GG, yeah, we agree. You, you've stated things that we already know. So the prioritization arguments tell us if those assumptions show up in the 1AC, why they matter. This is also where like the K prior type arguments sort of show up. Well, the framework argument explains those issues. Now, there are different names for these arguments, and we're going to go through each one of them and sort of break them down. Some of them you probably have heard in various parts of the debate. Term the first. Our critique is a prior question. Who has heard that phrase before? How many of you are like, I've lost to the critique is a prior question? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we've all been there. <coughs> what this means is, and I'll repeat it, the problems we've identified in the 1AC need to be addressed before evaluating the impacts of the affirmative. I'll give you a couple seconds and then I'll repeat. The problems we've identified in the 1AC need to be addressed before evaluating the impacts of the affirmative. Also means the way AVS just deciding the debate cannot take place until the set of assumptions, uh, assumptions, excuse me, in the 1AC are tested. What, are, what do you think I mean by tested? What, what are we, why do we need to test them? What does that mean to test? What are we doing? Yes. Well, um, I would say like poking holes in the affirmative, like seeing what's wrong with it first before we go about like what they're trying to solve for. But if I, but if we're in this room and I'm giving you a test, what am I trying to do? What am I trying to see if you have to see if you're? What am I? What am I doing? Yes. Stop. It proves that you can <coughs> find every part of the ones. Right. Like you have to justify your assumptions. You have to justify. Right. You have to prove that these assumptions are indeed. Not bad. Okay? I'm sorry, I heard some chatter. We good or we need to repeat that? <coughs> Alright, so this goes back to the evidence I showed you before, the Cox evidence, um, about problem solving versus critical theory. Problem solving, i.e. the affirmative, accepts the world as it is. Critical theory says we need to test the world as it is given to break down those set of assumptions and values to see if those things are good. And I'll repeat that here in a second. Or are we good? Repeat or we're good? Gotcha. Critical theory, i.e. the critique, not the critique, but critiques, say we need to test the world as it is given and break down those set of assumptions or values to see if those things are good. A shortened way to say this is to say, before we attempt to change the world within its givenness, we need to see if we need to accept the world as it is first. Does that make sense? Make sense? 
Here's an example. Problem. The development of indigenous subs risks U.S.-Taiwan war. Solution. We should reduce our direct commercial sales and foreign military sales of arms to the Republic of China. Prior question. Ought the construction of China as a threat be projected? Should we be in the business of constantly framing China as a threat? Remember, this goes back to what I said before. Do we have to construct China as a threat in order to say that arms sales are bad? Is it a necessary component of the affirmative? All right. Turn to the second. Framework. Okay. Yes. Max here. He is not. Hold on. Pause for a second. Jack, did you text him? The office located. They just asked to confirm whether he had made it. He is not made it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you send him another text and ask him where he is. I just want to make sure. Thanks. The definition of a framework is a critique may establish, I'm sorry, it's not a bit. Uh, a critique may establish a different framework for deciding the debate. Some people also say it's a different role of the ballot. Okay? <clears throat> yes? Um, what's the difference between a role of the ballot and a framework? I'm here to say that there's probably not a real difference. And so I think the stuff I'm about to talk about right now will set, sort of clarify why that's not a big difference. Most policy affirmatives assume the judge is a policymaker. Presented with the object of U.S. foreign policy to Taiwan, uh, is it beneficial, yes or no? Well, framework, you're asking the judge to think and act differently than a policymaker. We are evaluating not only the effect of the affirmative plan, but of the affirmative advocacy. Remember, the entirety of the affirmative. What does it mean to endorse the 1AC? Do I need to repeat any of that? Okay. Most policy affirmatives assume the judge is a policymaker. Uh, the framework you ask the judge to think and act differently than a policymaker. Because we are evaluating not only the effects of the affirmative plan, but of the affirmative ad advocacy. One second, David. David, right? Is David? Uh, David. David, sorry. One second, David. What does it mean to endorse the 1AC? Okay, Daniel, go. So I just have a question about um, the ballot and how it relates to the alternative. So um, what arguments do critical teams make to explain why they change the worldviews that exist within the debate space through one ballot? Okay, hold that thought because I want to go through the alternative conversation and then we'll come back to that question. Okay? I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but that is a good question to ask, and we'll talk about it at the end. So type that down, save it, don't forget it. Framework says that in order to weigh the impact of the affirmative, we would have to make some ethically unacceptable choices. There are like various examples of this. Uh, there are like questions that cross ask people tend to ask like, would you would you kill a million babies if it meant Hitler didn't exist? Right? That kind of weird kind of conversation, right? Something that is a little unethical. We think killing babies is kind of unethical. I assume you all think killing babies is unethical, but I don't know. Maybe you're okay. I saw a hand in the back and just stretch it. Question. Question, yes. Um, so, from the affirmative perspective, how do you suggest answering some of those questions if you're not 100% sure what critique the other side's going to go for? Ask that question one more time. How do you answer questions that the other team may ask you that relate to the critique? Oh, say that for the end. We'll do that in okay. the Q&A section, okay? So, here's, an, here's a couple of examples to sort of help hammer this home. Even if improving the process, prospects of U.S.-China relations, given the history of American exceptionalism, it is ethically unacceptable for us to endorse the 1AC. If we win our link arguments, right, 
it is ethically unacceptable for us to endorse the 1AC, even if it improves U.S. relations. See how framework is changing the location of what impact arguments are important, right? The more important thing is what American exceptionalism <coughs> does, not how do we improve U.S.-China uh, relations. Here's a more grounded sort of example that doesn't deal with the topic, but I think it's a little interesting. Resolution. The United States federal government should substantially decrease the crime rate in America. The problem is that crime rate is high in cities such as Atlanta, Chicago, Milwaukee, and Detroit. The solution is to, one, increase police presence within the set number of cities whose data indicate that those cities are overrun with crime, and two, to station new police precincts in areas where I, the ideal criminal lives. Under a problem-solution mindset, that affirmative seems perfectly fine. But the critique would say, in this instance, maybe we shouldn't evaluate the impacts of crime because the values established by the 1AC is a form of racial profiling, and racial profiling is racist and unacceptable. The question of the effectiveness of racial profiling should not be up for debate. That is what I mean by changing the location of what impacts are important and what impacts are not. Does that make sense? All right. We are critiquing the basic notion that it is acceptable for finding this particular solution. The effectiveness is irrelevant. Uh, is irrelevant uh, because our links are about racial profiling and the police are, if, the, if our links about racial profiling and the police are true, and you are a rational subject and know the world works as the world works, why then should we choose this solution? That the choice you made, this goes back to the thing I said earlier, the choice you made has some problematic underpinnings that means we need to reject the entirety of the 1AC. <clears throat> we could combine these two things to say, that we shouldn't consider the affirmative impacts, and that we are trying, and that you trying to get us to care about those impacts are unacceptable. The 1AC will fall on its own terms, and those terms are unacceptable. If the 1AC fails, what are we debating? The case. What does it prove? Don't vote for the F. And then lastly, and this is probably uh, some arguments you all have probably heard, you'll hear a framework argument that attempts to, attempts to change what the judge should consider when making a decision about the debate. And it sort of sounds like this. The judge should only consider the debate from the perspective of blah, 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 blah. That blank can be filled in in a variety of ways. The judge should only consider the debate from the perspective of black women, or should only consider the perspective of the body located in a hole, or the, uh, the perspective of Native Americans, Etc. 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 It's designed to say these people and only these people are the ones we should listen to, not the one people in, uh, in the one AC. The last terminology uh, for these set of arguments uh, that change how you evaluate the debate sometimes are referred referred to as discursive or represent, rep, representational critiques. So above I said, it's not just about what um, is said, but why the 1AC made sense or is valuable or desirable. These are questions of who gets to say what. Sometimes people say discourse uh, in debate to say all that matters is language. And I have some evidence I'm going to show you here, and I want you all to think about this when people say the word discursive criticism, that those people aren't saying that only language matters, they're making an argument about discourse concerns and how they matter in policy. So it's not just that only language matters, but language always matters. We are never making a simple description about, of the world. We are making normative judgments about the world when we engage in a description. Sure. <coughs> The argument is that, I'm oh, sorry, let's get started. We're making this, 
So above I said, sometimes people say <coughs> in the debate, uh, to say that all that matters is language. Really what I think they're saying is that language always matters, not that it only matters. Uh, we are never simply making a description of a, or, a, or a objective description of the world. We are also making a normative judgment about the world when we engage it. It's an argument that we cannot get outside of language. There's no real such thing as objectivity. A phrase you'll commonly hear in debate and in the literature is that language constitutes our world. Language constructs our world. What does that mean? What does it mean when people say language constitutes our world? Yes, sir. One way we can understand like, our world is like, by the way we discuss it or um, like, explain it through words. What does it mean to constitute something? What does it mean? Nicholas? To make up something. To make up something? Vin Ray? Oh, so, yeah. Right? To constitute means to construct, <coughs> to build. Language builds the world as it wants to see it. It makes up that world. It ties together so that we can uh, pay special attention to language because any time that we are communicating with each other, we aren't just describing the world, we are building the world together. When the 1AC gets read and the impact scenarios are created, we are building that world that, in the instance of Taiwan, China is a threat to democracy, to sort of war and conflict, etc. It is building that world and it is that which is what the critique wants to criticize. So I want to talk about another piece of evidence. This is an oldie but a goodie in my eyes. Uh, Shapiro 92. Some of the coaches in this room are like, oh, I remember Shapiro. All right. Who wants to read the first set of green for me? Yes, sir. The kinds of discursive practices implicit spatial arrangements is rarely available because the contemporary policy talk. All right, let's stop. When we say policy talk, we're referring to the affirmative. Okay? So policy talk, affirmative. Go ahead. The shape of the arena within which policy is conceived is taken for granted. These arenas are not an audible part of policy talk. They exist. All right, let's stop for a second. I'm sorry, I keep doing that because I want to talk about certain things. This evidence points out that it's not just what is said, but sometimes we don't even have to say for it to build discourse, okay? It's not just what is said, but what is unsaid in the 1AC. Continue. They exist at a silent level. Uh -huh. There are a series of power inscriptions that do their effective work without being read. They belong to a political rhetoric that is implicit <coughs> in society's spatial practices. As part of its ground plan, it situates intelligible speaker actors who produce meaningful and effective policy utterances and actions. They render coherent discourses that bestow meaning and value to <coughs> actions and relationships. All right, situates. What does it mean to situate something? That word appears in a lot of critical literature. What does that mean? Yeah, it's a locate, sort of put it in its place. Okay? All right. Who wants to read this last part for me? Then read it. Those who use a discourse for institutionalized practice with its meaning and value as opposed to reaffirmed and exchanged generally fail to discern the historically developed presupposed practices that ventriloquate to themselves that are the Ooh, ventriloquate. Who's seen that word before? Mm, okay, Carlos, what does ventriloquate mean? Right, to control. To control, okay. What does a uh, ventriloquist do? Control the dummy, right? You got his hand, there's a puppet. Check my voice. I can't do that clearly. Uh, ventriloquate, right? The person who is speaking with the dummy. This is the way of saying that through discursive practices, a lot of times we are the dummies. Because we're saying a bunch of stuff, but we aren't in control of it. That's what it means to situate a set of eligible 
speakers and actors. The 1AC is rare. The 1AC is full of experts telling us how to think about the world, and we are not critically reflecting about the world. That is what it means to ventriloquate. We are merely the policymakers' puppets. Criticism say this is a problem. That when we speak the language of policy, we accept the world as given, and we accept the world should continue as such. Critical theory says we should not do that. That instead, we should no longer be perceived as a dummy, as the mouthpiece for the sort of imperfect assumptions that our link arguments have established. Right? So, what is the definition of discourse? We sort of this is sort of like what good uh, when you're reading through critique literature. Sometimes you look for definitions, right, of what the author means by certain words. What does discourse mean? Is your hand up, or are you just sort of stretching? All right, yes. Yeah, uh, like written and spoken communication that talks about huh? how. Remember, in the beginning, it also said things that remain silent. Remember. They exist at a silent level. So sometimes it's not just necessarily written or for consumption, but it is what is unsaid. All right? What I'm also saying is that it is clearly defined. Right? It is really legitimately defined in this part. Don't. Loud, say it loud. An institutionalized practice through which meaning and values is supposed to reaffirm and change. Exactly. Discourse is not only imposed, like right, like with a hammer, right, I am imposing my way of thinking on you, but it is reaffirmed and exchanged. This is like where ventriloquism, uh, ventriloquate comes into play, right? If we do not critically reflect on sort of the dangerous assumptions that the link evidence is talking about, when we constantly say China threat, insert threat, Middle East threat, terrorist threat, black body threat, this threat, et cetera, threat, right? We do not challenge those set of things. We then go to reaffirm those set of assumptions. And then we 